This is for those who believe in the potential of science. Making brave choices, choosing to push the boundaries. This is why we believe in what science can do. It's great to be here today, and I'm so delighted to be able to follow Carol, because in this way you begin to see the different sides of science. There are so many ways to indulge your interest in, in science and to do it. And one of the ways is curiosity-driven research, and another way is to apply the knowledge that has come about through curiosity-driven research to do things that have immediate applications right away. One of the things that's happened over the last several years is that the distance between when you might get a basic advance and when it happens in patients is getting shorter and shorter. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today. And much of what Carol has said will be applicable, so this will be good. I was five years old when the structure of DNA was determined. Over the next few years, while the basis of molecular biology was being in place, the family grew. My parents were, my father was a music uh, teacher and a musician. My mother was, uh, worked for the state of New Mexico. My brothers and sisters and I all grew up encouraged to do that which we were interested in. So I became a scientist, that's me in high school. My brother Richard was an investigator for the Federal Bureau of Investigations, the sort of the defense part of the Justice Department. My sister Catherine is a lawyer and a judge, and she and I collaborated when she had her first murder case that involved using examining DNA of both the victim and the perpetrator. Uh, this brother here is also a jazz musician and a music teacher. My sister Dorothea is an executive at Honda America, and Lawrence is a si award-winning science teacher in Texas. He teaches students of your age. As you heard, I got interested in science at a very early age. I think I was nine years old when I decided I wanted to be a scientist. Now, mind you, I'm not sure I knew what a scientist was. However, I grew up, as you see, in a very large family, in a very small house, and I had a lot of cousins, like a hundred of them. And so my idea of science was a big, empty, quiet room <laughs> where I could do what I wanted to do. Well, of course, that's not really how science gets done. You have to work with a lot of other people. But it did lead me down a good path, and that's how I ended up being the only girl in a physics class visiting Los Alamos, New Mexico. Well, after I graduated from high school, I went to Goucher College, where I studied muscles and worms. I got married. I went to MIT to go to graduate school. I graduated there. I went to Harvard University to study the development of the eggshell of the wild American silk moth. Uh, and here, in these studies, I learned a lot about what can't, sometimes doesn't work in science. One of the realities about doing really interesting science is that a lot of the time it doesn't work. And some of the reasons it doesn't work is often because you don't have the tools. We were trying to take the DNA of this silkworm and analyze it for individual genes. But we didn't have the right tools to do that. The DNA in that silkworm was as much DNA as a human. And in those days, you simply couldn't do it. There were no kits to do it. It's a little bit like you know trying to, you, there were no Google Maps. There were no cell phones at one point. I didn't have the tools I needed to do those experiments. But when I left the silk moth lab, I had a lot of new skills that I had learned in trying to do those unsuccessful experiments. And that's another lesson I think you can learn, is that when you don't succeed in doing something, very frequently you learn lessons that will be applicable in your next endeavor, and you will be a success. And so cloning insulin is more or less what I'm known for. So I thought I'd divide my talk into two pieces. One is how we did that, and then the other is what I'm sort of doing today. So how many of you know somebody with diabetes? Of those people, how many are taking insulin? All persons taking insulin today are taking insulin that it's made on variations of the methods that we discovered back in the 70s when we did the experiment that I'm about to describe to you. And this was done by a group of us 
working in the laboratory of Wally Gilbert, who was at Harvard University and won the Nobel Prize uh, in part for developing a method for determining the sequences of DNA. Insulin is made in an organ called the pancreas. The pancreas is pretty small. In a human being, it's you know maybe two finger size, uh, smaller than that. And the cells, the piece of it that's making insulin is you know like a fingertip. Well, if you're studying this in mice and you need a model system because it's not allowed for you to go in and take somebody's beta cells out easily, um, a mouse is very small. Their pancreas is going to be very small and their islets where the insulin is made is going to be very small. And there are other problems about the biochemistry of those cells which make it very difficult. So one of our collaborators at the Diabetes Foundation, uh, the, the Joslin Clinic in uh, Boston, took some mice and he irradiated them. He gave them a lot of radiation, enough to kill the mouse. But what he did then was to connect that mouse that had been irradiated to a healthy mouse. He just cut them open and connected their blood systems together. And the healthy mouse kept the irradiated mouse alive. Well, that irradiated mouse did live, but it developed a tumor. And the tumor was in the pancreas, a pancreatic tumor. And that tumor could be isolated it could be made into little pieces, put into other mice, grow it up, and so you could get a lot of pancreatic cell tumor, and it made insulin. It made a lot of insulin. So we could take the messenger RNA for insulin out of that tumor, and using some wonderful technology that had been developed a few years before we began this project, we could take that RNA, and we could copy it into double-stranded DNA. We could take that DNA and hook it up, mix it up with some DNA from bacteria that had very special properties. One was it would confer upon bacterial cells that got it the ability to live in the presence of a drug which ordinarily would kill the bacteria. And two, we had some other tricks, which I'll come to. So what we did was connect them in this way, and it's really just circles of DNA uh, being put together with these molecular tools which had become available, putting them into bacteria, choosing the bacteria that lived through the antibiotic treatment, and then examining every one of those things uh, to find the ones that, that had the insulin cDNA. We also found one out of the 42 clones that we got that seemed to be making insulin itself. And so the accomplishment that we did was to prove that bacteria could make an a, a, a hormone that was made in mice and men. Well, that's the basis of an enormous amount of biotechnology today. There are companies, one company was founded on this, Biogen, which is one of the larger biotech companies now uh, in the country and in the world. And there are medicines that are given to people which are made by these methods. They are cloned copies of proteins, hormones, antibodies that are being used to treat people now, today. All right, so let's move forward very quickly. After this work at Harvard as a postdoc, I took a job as an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts, worked my way up to, to professor and got tenure, moved to Harvard Medical School where I set up a laboratory and worked for eight years and had a lot of fun. At Harvard Medical School, one of the projects that we did was to examine the role of a particular protein called amyloid in Alzheimer's disease. One of you had asked a question about that. We were the first to show that amyloid damaged neural type cells. And now, today, what people are trying to do is develop medicines which prevent amyloid from building up in the brain. And there's a new drug which is just coming out to be going into clinical trials uh, sometime this month. I have to say, though, that there have been 20 to 30 drugs that inhibit the uh, buildup of amyloid, which have not worked. So don't hold your breath. I then went to Northwestern University in a kind of a change of direction in field. I became what's called an academic administrator. So I left doing experiments for a time, and I went to a university where my job was really quite wonderful because my job was to make it possible for people to do research in all kinds of fields. All the sciences, 
I had to uh, help. And I also got to help those people who were doing things like studying Buddhism in the deserts of China. So it was a, a very fun job. However, my husband and I were commuting. I was in Chicago, he was in Boston, we went back and forth. That was fun, but seven years, you know, enough already. So I went back to Boston and became the uh, vice president for research at the Whitehead Institute. And there I stayed for three years, uh, ran into Wally Gilbert again. His son started Cytono in its first iteration, which had this logo. And John Gilbert had a vision. His vision was to help clinical uh, applications of cellular therapy. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Well, I became the CEO of Cytonome. Uh, one of the important things about a biotech company is that you have to support it by finding money for it. No money, no company. And there are no extensions of time. You run out of money, the company's dead. So as CEO, my job was to find money for the company just as 2008 hit, which was the recession. So for two years, uh, me and a couple of people who were interested in the company kept the company alive. We then found a partner, ST, which was interested in making more milk cows. And they got interested in our technology, so we formed a partnership. They brought the money, we brought the know-how and we formed the company called Cytonome ST. I could step back and become now chief scientific officer and a board member, and Cytonome is now uh, has this application. And we do have machines out on the market for ST, and we'll maybe have time to talk about that. A little um, explanation before we go on. I want you to have a sense of the size of things that we're talking about. If you were a continent, if a, if a person was the size of a continent, the North and South America here, then a person would be approximately the size of one of these big cruisers that goes around and takes people on cruises. And a protein in that cell would be the size, would range from the size of the dog's tail to the dog itself. So those are the kinds of scales that we deal with. That means that in molecular biology and in biotechnology, Examining how things are going on is not easy. It's all little tubes of clear liquids. So you have to be able to follow what's going on in those little tubes of clear liquids, and that's where tools come in. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. We've already talked a little bit about bone marrow transplants and their, uh, where they come from. And you've already said that you know things about bone marrow transplants. Well, cellular therapy is using cells, whole living cells, as treatment for disease. And bone marrow transplants have been in use for over 30 years. So this is a good thing, and they've been used, if most of you may know, that bone marrow transplants have been used primarily to treat cancer. What happens there is you take the person with cancer, you irradiate them, much as we irradiated that mouse, to kill the cancer cells within the individual, and then you put in new stem cells, as, as Dr. Greider described, and those stem cells repopulate the blood and the immune system of the individual, and in many cases, you can get a cure. Well, it turns out bone marrow transplants are good not only for cancer, but also for a number of other things. These two brothers here, um, in fact, have this, this is the older brother. These guys have the same disease. It's a disease, a genetic disease, which is very devastating. Children who have this disease have me severe mental retardation and their muscles don't work because their nervous system is messed up. This child was diagnosed when he was three months old and he got a bone marrow transplant. So he has normal intelligence, but as you can see, he's, he is restricted to a wheelchair and his muscles don't work. His younger brother was diagnosed before he was even born. And as soon as this child was born, he was given a bone marrow transplant. And this was done at Duke University. And he's a completely normal kid now. He's probably, I think this child is now 12 or 13 or 14. So bone marrow transplants are useful not only for cancers, but also for genetic diseases and for a number of other things that, that would be very, very good to have a cure for. There's a problem, though, with bone marrow transplants. Um, usually, you don't have a twin, and you need a twin if you're going to have a bone marrow transplant without much trouble. 
because what's in that bone marrow trans uh, transplant? Well, there's the stem cells that Carol uh, talked about, there's the blood cells, and there are cells whose job it is to protect the individual from disease and from bad cells. In a normal, healthy human being, those immune cells are prowling around all the time and they're looking for germs and they kill them. And they're looking for cells that have gone bad. So if you have a cell whose telomerase is too long, most of the time, a cancerous cell is destroyed by your immune system. So it's only occasionally, believe it or not, that it breaks through and turns into cancer. Well, the problem is if you give person A the bone marrow from person B, the immune system of person B is going to perceive person A as foreign, and the cells of the immune system are going to attack the patient. And so there are ways to deal with this that have been used in bone marrow transplants, but they don't always work, and it's, so it's, it's a dangerous and high-risk procedure that is done only in the most uh, unusual of circumstances. So John's vision was to make a machine that would make it possible to separate out the cells uh, of the immune system. And they already existed such technology. So here's where you get bone marrow. You can either stick a needle in a person's hip, go right into the bone, into the marrow, and pull it out. Or, more comfortably, you can hook a line up to each of the arms of a donor, and blood and cells come out one tube. The white cells are are collected into a bag, which you can barely see hanging there, and everything that the clinician doesn't want is put back into the other arm. So most bone marrow transplants are done that way. And here's what's in blood. It's mostly liquid with a lot of protein in it. Uh, there's a bunch of red blood cells. Those are the guys that keep you oxygenated, so you can actually sit there and listen to me. And then this little band here represents the 1% of the preparation, which is white blood cells, and in that white blood cells, only a tenth of a percent of those are the stem cells. There's a new advance in bone marrow technology, derived from bone marrow technology. And in this technology, what you do is you take those immune killer cells, the ones that kill cancer cells, out of a patient that has cancer. You take the ones that are, seem to have some effect against his or her cancer, and you grow a whole bunch of them in culture. And there's, you can treat them in various ways. There's about three variations of this treatment. Then what you do is you put them back in the patient. So they're, they're his own cancer-killing cells that you've put back in the patient. And in this patient here, this is a melanoma that was literally growing out of his ear, these tumors. And you can see how it got worse while his cells were growing up. And then his cells were injected, and the tumor went away. This is very exciting advance in cancer biology. And there have been some remarkable reports of patients being successfully treated with this new kind of technology using cellular therapy. But it's really hard to do because selecting the cells is not easy, growing them is not easy, and so it's a very, very difficult procedure right now. So what we'd like to do is make that easier. So the problem is, that when you look at these cells that kill cancer cells and all the other immune cells in a blood sample of white blood cells, they all pretty much look alike. However, they differ, they have different jobs, and so they differ on cells that they, on the proteins that they have on their surface. And so if there's a way to visualize those proteins, then you could tell them apart. Well, there is. And all of this was happening while I was growing up. Uh, there's a kind of a protein called an antibody, which some of you have probably heard about. And antibodies can be purified and grown up in very large numbers, and you can buy them from any number of companies. You can also tag them. So in this case, we're going to tag them with a molecule that changes color when it gets hit by a laser. And there are a whole variety of these. Well, once we've done that, we can mix the antibodies with the cells, and they will attach to those proteins. And now we have a color tag on the cells. So all we have to do is be able to see it and separate it. And there's two ways that that has been done now since about 1972 or so. The first way is this way, which is using a laser. And in this thing, what you do is you take your cells that have been labeled with these colored molecules, and you run them in a liquid stream past a laser. As the laser hits the cell, the light changes because now the little antibody has glowed. 
and the computer is there analyzing things, and it says what color is on the cell, how much of it is there, and then by the time the cell has fallen down to this area, a decision is made as to what, what you want to do with that. And you can, do, you can move it in one direction or another because the droplet that the cell is in is charged. So you can collect the cells that you want. You can collect two groups of them, actually, or more. And any cell that you don't want can fall into the waste. This is very handy, and it's been a very powerful tool. The problem for clinicians is that in this process, the cell is falling through free air. That's a problem because if you're doing something that you want to put into a sick person, you'd kind of like to know it doesn't have anything else that it's picked up along the way. And so this is one of the reasons that it's been difficult because you have to go to extraordinary lengths to make sure that this is done sterilely. And also, it's not that fast. Um, it's pretty fast, actually. You can do this at about 20 to 30,000 cells per second can be examined. But in the world of clinical therapy, that's not really very fast. There's another way you can tag those antibodies, and that's with a magnet. In this case, you can do the same thing. You tag it with a magnet. It will attach to the cell. But now you can't tell which protein the antibodies have attached to. You can't tell them apart because magnets all look alike. The advantage, though, is you can take those magnetically targeted uh, cells, run them through a magnet when the magnet's on, and any cell that doesn't have a magnet on it gets washed right through. And then you move the thing over and turn off the magnet and wash it, and all the cells will collect for you in a nice little tube. This can be done sterilely. Everything's enclosed in tubes and bags, and it's very fast. It's a batch process. So you can take literally trillions of cells, 10 to the 11 cells, which is about what you pull out of an individual that is a donor, and you can do it all at once but they're not separated. So what you'd really like is something that's fast and sterile, but uses the laser technology. And that was John Gilbert's vision. So in order to realize this vision, he had to invent a new thing. And he is an inventor. Um, and so what he invented was this little microfluidic switch. It's a little tiny switch that uh, the cells go through in a liquid path. Over here is where the laser shines on the cells as they go by. And between here and here, the computer decides if it wants that cell or not. If you want the cell, when it gets here, a little pin pushes up on this, which is a bubble of air. This is a liquid column. The liquid column moves just a little bit, just enough to move the cell from this path, where it'll go down this tube into the waste, into this path, which then gets kept. Because this is little, this is a couple of, I forget, Oh, this is nine microns, and that's, I don't know what, a couple of, cent of millimeters. You can line them up. So this chip right here, with its associated plumbing, has, I believe, 72 of these little microchannels. Well, surround that with a laser, some plumbing, uh, some software, and a bunch of other very sophisticated but not novel uh, electronics, mechanics, and so forth, the things that engineers do. This company is mostly engineers. Then you get a machine like this in which you can separate the cells of the immune system. It took a long time to make this dream real. John had the concept in 2002. We built the first machine in 2006. We now have a prototype in 2010, which works most of the time. And now in 2015, we're talking to a couple of companies who would like to make it even better and use it in some of their cell therapy experiments. Will that work or not? We don't know. So the story's not over. And that's one of the really most exciting things to me about science. The story is never over. There's always something new to find out, uh, either on the basic side, the clinical side, the in-between side, and all of it requires a great deal of um, really desire to do it. That's what you really mostly need. So I'm going to stop there. That's all good. Thank you.